The president says this is a war of necessity, not of choice. If it's a necessity, that is because we dare not have a failed state in Afghanistan that becomes a camp for al-Qaeda. The same argument would have us in and fighting and nation building in the Yemen and Somalia. That was conservative columnist George F. Will just over a week ago on George Stephanopoulos' This Week Roundtable, followed up today with a big-time column in The Washington Post. Obama's now getting squeezed on Afghanistan from the left and the right. That classic team of Russ Feingold and George Will. Top Line starts right now. Hello and welcome to ABCNews.com's Top Line. I'm David Chalian. And I'm Rick Klein. Each weekday, we're here bringing you the latest political headlines, reporting, insight, analysis, everything you need and want to know. And keep the conversation going all day long. It's Twitter.com slash The Note. Let us know what you think. Kick us off, sir. What's your Top Line? Terror wars. We have been down this road before, but once again, the Obama administration at war with Dick Cheney and others on the Republican side over the efficacy of CIA interrogation techniques. This time we're seeing uh, Jim Jones, the national security advisor, trotted out to rebut uh, the vice president of the United States. Uh, but this is, just, this is just versions of the same fight that we have seen for months. Jim Jones telling our Jake Tapper that it's not entirely clear that they, uh, you know, did everything right to keep us safe for eight years, that that could be just... Uh, a, a happenstance. Uh, Obama's Afghanistan problem. Yes, as we said at the top, squeezed from the left and the right. A week after the liberal Democratic Senator Russ Feingold says it's time for a timetable for withdrawal of U.S. troops from Afghanistan, George Will, conservative columnist, comes up with the same idea. It's time to pull out of Afghanistan, attack from outside the country. And this is at a time that he is pondering a request that's, that's forthcoming for more troops, and it's hard to see him turning down that request, given what he has said before about uh, what, he, what needs to be done in Afghanistan, the critique he's had in the past. But you're right, we're seeing uh, just a, a fraying of public support and now reflected in both the left and the right. Return of the Govs. Rod Blagojevich has a new book out that has some not-so-nice things to say about White House Chief of Staff Rahm Emanuel. And more intriguingly, there's a report today in the New York Post that Elliot Spitzer may want back in in this wide-open year in New York politics where you've got the potential for a Senate seat and a gubernatorial seat. I'm not buying that Spitzer's... Uh, don't print out those bumper stickers quite <laughs> yeah. yet. I, I'm, not, I'm not buying it at all. I mean, <laughs> I, I buy the fact that he maybe is talking about this to some of his closest friends that he would like back in, but I'm not buying that he's actually getting back in. Some things are just too difficult to overcome. Prostitution scandal is probably one of them. <laughs> Corzine versus Christie. Yes, the battle in the Garden State not going in the Democrats' direction. Where There's a new poll out today, a Quinnipiac University poll showing a 10-point gap. I think it's 47% to 37%. Uh, in, in Chris Christie's favor, the Republican candidate, Rick, this poll shows a wider gap than Corzine had him a few weeks ago after two of the worst weeks of news coverage for Chris Christie. This cannot be welcome news in the Corzine campaign. Well, that's just it. This was a, the, a lot of Democrats saw the news the last two weeks and said, wow, Corzine is going to turn this corner, the incumbent governor, and he is going to rally right now. It's hard to imagine a bigger story hitting Chris Christie to, to, to try to edge those numbers down. This is a big gap. Speaking of former govs back in the game, yesterday Rick and I sat down for an interview with the former governor of Pennsylvania, Tom Ridge. He has a new book, The Test of Our Times. He was, of course, the first Homeland Security Secretary under the Bush administration. And this one line in his piece gets a lot of attention. Uh, at, right at the tail end of that 2004 presidential election with John Kerry, when Osama bin Laden had a tape and there was a discussion with uh, the Security Council inside the Bush administration whether or not to raise the terror threat. And he said... I wondered, is this about security or politics? That's where our conversation began. And we are now joined by the former governor of Pennsylvania, Tom Ridge, former secretary of the Department of Homeland Security, which is the big topic of your book, The Test of Our Times, just out uh, today. Uh, thank you very much for being here, Governor. Uh, Thanks for joining you. Thanks for the invitation. Uh, I want to begin, obviously, your, this one piece of your book has gotten so much attention, so many headlines, and I realize that, uh, you, you know, you said the system works, so I'm not even going to delve into that. I just, you do actually write in the book, though, that you questioned in your own mind, you wanted to make sure and think through, is politics at hate play here in addition to national security? I'm wondering, what caused you to question that? What did you see that caused that question to come up in your mind? Uh, well, you're right. I am musing in the book about a very dramatic conversation that we had the weekend before the national election. Uh, it was uh, unlike any other conversation we had given its closeness to the election, but we had many of these uh, secure video conferences about whether or not we should raise the threat level. 
uh, more often than not, we didn't go up. And people on, uh, would argue and, and talk about intelligence because security was always uppermost in my mind. And at the end of that discussion, uh, when several of my colleagues argued to go up, others argued to go down, or argued that there was no need to change the threat level, uh, I'm using the book, uh, is there something else? Am I missing something? Is it politics? Is it security? I'm not going to impugn the motives of any of the men or women with whom I work because security was always uh, in foremost of their minds. I'm just uh, musing in this book, and at the end of the day, we all had our discussion. We didn't go up, and we made the right decision. So it was musings only. There was nothing else that got your antenna no, I, listen, up? I've, I work with Attorney General Ashcroft every single day. We started the day in the, uh, the Oval Office when the president was in town. Uh, worked uh, not directly as much with uh, Secretary Rumsfeld, but with Department of Defense. Uh, and uh, it's not about uh, challenging or second guessing why they argued so strongly. We felt just the opposite and as strongly. So at this point of the book, I'm saying to myself, if we raise the threat level, you've got a lot of work to do. Am I missing something? I say in the book, is it politics or security? Don't read anything more into it. That's it, pure and simple. <laughs> now, and the right decision was made. Remember in 2004, you saying very sternly when, when questioned about the idea of politics being part of Homeland Security, yep. we don't do politics Correct. at the Department of Homeland Security. Could you say the same now with, with a couple years removed about the Bush administration absolutely. in general? Yeah, absolutely. I, here, here's a couple points, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to make the point. Uh, first of all, the system that was designed uh, under President Bush was designed so that uh, no single individual could affect the outcome, not even the president himself. It was designed around the, the notion that before we would raise the threat level, uh, there would have to be a consensus among most of his cabinet members. We had several of those discussions. More often than not, we decided not to raise the threat level. But these were serious discussions, hard decisions, judgment calls. Uh, and politics, uh, I said that, I mean, I made a mistake in August of uh, uh, 2004. Uh, you probably remember, middle of the conventions, I lauded uh, President Bush's leadership in the war on terror during a press conference when we were raising the threat level. I lauded the president. The press conference was about raising the threat level. Right. By my inclusion of that sentence or two, I marginalized uh, the importance of the press conference, the decision that was reached by consensus, and the importance of the intelligence. So as I look back on my career and as my service, that's one of those things I regret, and I, I take responsibility for it because it created that perception, right? And the perception was wrong, and I was responsible for creating it, right? Gov Governor, I I'm curious when you look now uh, at this debate that's happening with the uh, Attorney General Eric Holder investigating uh, the yeah. CIA. Uh, here we are having a, another national security debate to some degree, and I'm wondering, do you think politics is at play with that investigation? Uh, again, I'm not going to second guess uh, President Obama or a Attorney General's motivation. But I do think it's rather ironic uh, that President Obama himself has sev said several times, uh, as we all know, he had many differences with President Bush. But he's also, and he articulated them, and he said that it's about time for us not to look to the past, but to look to the future. Uh, when you listen to Attorney General Holden, you kind of wonder if he got the memo. Uh, but more importantly, the notion that a couple of years after individuals doing what they thought they were empowered to do, doing what they were told was consistent with the law, somebody's interpretation, should be subject to this kind of investigation, potential criminal penalties. By the way, it's been investigated before. I think the notion is wrong and the conduct is close to outrageous. Uh, I want to ask you a question about uh, Pennsylvania, your home state. There was some talk about you getting into the Senate race there, and right. I, you, you, you declined to do so. What, what, is, what is your take on, first of all, the, the Democratic primary uh, that pits Arlen Specter uh, against, uh, against Congressman Joe Sestak? Are you, do, you think, do you think Arlen Specter is likely to prevail based on what you know in Pennsylvania? Well, you know, I, for one, had, uh, saw Arlen Specter and worked with him in our party. I just, uh, I've said this a couple of times, you know, people go to the Alamo, uh, not because they prevailed, but they stood there and fought for something they believed in. So I would have preferred he stayed and fight within the Republican Party. The fact that he's going to lose and, so, and says, well, I'm a little concerned that I may lose the primary, I think there's a real good chance he could end up losing in the Democrat primary. I think uh, Congressman Chestick is a very formidable foe. And I think because of that debate, uh, our candidate appears to be the, uh, the heir apparent and the only nominee, Pat Toomey, I think has an excellent chance of winning in the fall. Uh, Governor... Next year. Uh, you went through the process of uh, being vetted by John McCain to be his potential uh, yeah. vice presidential running mate uh, last year. When you watched the fall campaign take place and Sarah Palin becoming this sort of phenomenon inside herself, 
Did you ever have a moment of a tang in the heart where you wish you were up there being the vice presidential running mate? Oh, of course. I mean, I think the, the opportunity to run uh, with my friend, uh, with John McCain, a friend of mine, we both got elected in 1982. It would have been a great honor and privilege, but uh, I respect my friend's uh, decision and regret that uh, my work as national uh, co-chair with others uh, didn't work out. Uh, as you noticed, our team came in second. Uh, so I, I, I obviously regret that, particularly since I don't think that the change that is being promoted in Washington, D.C. is exactly where a, uh, uh, America thought we were going to go. But uh, that's politics. We have a chance to make changes in 2010, 2012, and I'll certainly work in the, within the Republican Party to, uh, uh, to affect the change on our side of the aisle and get more seats in the Congress and more governorships and and, and, and uh, keep fighting the good fight. Any chance of you being part of that conversation in 2012? Oh, I doubt it. I mean, I, you know, I, I, I certainly uh, would be flattered if it would be included. I, you know, I, I've told some folks before, I, I really think one of the challenges we have within our party uh, is to be a little bit more tolerant of uh, differences of opinion. I know that's anathema to some, uh, but I've had two calls from Republican presidents that have altered my life. Uh, I got a call from, actually I got a draft notice from President Nixon and I ended up as an <laughs> infantry staff sergeant in Vietnam and I got a call from my friend of uh, 20 some years, President Bush, who asked me yep. to leave a job I love to become uh, the White House uh, assistant to the President for Homeland Security and then secretary. On neither occasion, on neither occasion did these Republican presidents ask me where I was like on uh, gay rights, abortion and some of these other issues. Well, they just, they simply said to me, will you serve? And I think uh, that's the attitude that we ought to have, and I think that's the attitude that Ronald Reagan had, and I think it would be a very good idea if we want to be a national party, a formidable force, uh, that we had a higher degree of uh, a tolerance of differences of opinion within right. the party, if we want to be the majority. Governor Tom Ridge and former Homeland uh, Security Secretary, thank you very much for joining us. Good luck with the book tour, thank sir. Thank you. Nice to join you. Thank Thanks. you very much. Take care. We'll be back with more Top Line in just a moment.